special permutations in this Cayley graph, which is first this identity permutation, like one, two, three, in the example n equals to three. And then there is the reverse permutation when all the letters are reversed. So you can say that you made you know, maximum amount of transpos transpositions, you inverted the order of all letters. And the sorting network, by the definition, that is the shortest path between this identical permutation and the reverse permutation in the Cayley graph of the symmetric group. Okay, so what does it mean, shortest path? Well, when you interchange two letters in a permutation, there are two options. Maybe they were in increasing order and became in decreasing order, so you increase number of inversion, or maybe they were in decreasing order and after you sweep, so swap, they become an increasing order. Then you decrease the number of inversions. Now, if you have a shortest path, then you should be always only increasing number of inversions, which means that the number of inversions in your permutation will be just growing. You know, from zero here, there are no inversions in this permutation. All of, uh, of, the, all of the numbers are just, num are just ordered up to this permutation where there is a maximal number of inversions, which is n choose 2, uh, n times n minus 1 over 2. And you, the number of inversions will be growing one by one. So here you have start with zero inversions, then one inversion, two inversions, three inversions. OK, so that is the sorting network, yes? OK, so, 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 so what is an inversion and permutation? So you have two positions, and you look at the numbers in these positions. If they are ordered in increasing order, then there is no inversion. But if they are ordered in decreasing order, then there is an inversion. And then you just count how many are there pairs of positions such that the numbers are ordered in, dec in decreasing order. So here there are none of those, because all of them are increasing. But here, that's the maximal amount. <coughs> OK, now there are various. Now, geometrically, you can identify these sorting networks with various things, which might explain what, what is, why do we use the name sorting network. Well, one nice representation is so-called wiring diagram. So you should think about having n wires. So here n is equal to 4, which are first order at an increasing order, 1, 2, 3, 4. And uh, that's at the first moment of time. And at the last moment of time, they order it in the decreasing order. So all of them should be reversed. And then you want to link this thing by wires. And at each moment of time, you just allow only two adjacent wires to swap. And then you want to draw this wiring diagram. So that is just geometrical interpretation of this sorting network. So that's one thing. Another thing, <coughs> if you're interested in um, like computer science or programming, then you can identify this, uh, this sorting network with, well, really a network which makes a sorting. Because if you think about each swap, like each cross on this picture, as some elementary sorting element which takes two inputs and sorts them into the increasing order, then by using all these sorting elements, no matter what input you started with, the output will be sorted in the increasing order. So if you ever try to you know, code something like bubble sort algorithm, then it will be a particular case of this sorting network. <coughs> OK, there are many beautiful mathematical results about these sorting networks. The first ones already, so how many, that's like 35 years ago. So Richard Stanley was interested in how many are there sorting networks. And he found a very nice formula through some product of factorials. Like the formula is given there. So you fix the rank of your group. You count the number of sorting networks. And that's a beautiful formula that he discovered. So this sparkled many know, various projects in studying the sorting networks and beautiful mathematics around it, mostly in the area of algebraic combinatorics. So people were counting different things. And there were numerous articles related to that, just to mention some of them. So people were finding bijective proofs of this kind of you know, enumerative results. Then there were some weighted versions. There are two families of symmetric of, of you know, polynomials which appeared. One of them was Schubert polynomials. Another was Stanley symmetric functions. So there is, for example, a nice review of Adriana Garcia from 15 years ago, which is called Se the SEGO of Reduced Factorizations of Elements of the Symmetric Groups, it's like 150 pages, you know, summarize many different developments. Oh, yeah, that is in the combinatorics, but we are really in a random matrices school. So, so far, I don't have any matrices that will appear a little bit later, but let's first at least you know, say something about random objects. And here, the main <coughs> interest in developments happened like 10 years ago, where Omar Angel, Alexander Holroyd, uh, 
then Romic and uh, Balant Virak ask the question, okay, so fix n and choose certain network uniformly and random. Now, how does it really look like when n is large? So that was the question that they asked. So how this picture looks like when it's a huge picture? Well, there are various twists, you know, the sorting network is a complicated object, so that you can clarify what exactly you mean by this question, and then the answers will be very different. So here are three ways how you can clarify what you mean by that. So the first question that they also asked is what if you really look in these wiring diagrams on the trajectories of individual particles, or if you just look on one wire? So for example, this is a wire of particle number two, so it starts here, goes down, down, goes up to here. So you just look at the picture, you know, you will have huge wires and they have some trajectories. So how do the, how the trajectories, how do they look like <coughs> when n is large and you sample your certain network uniformly at random? <coughs> Here's a simulation which was done by Ander Horoid. So these lines, these are really trajectories of different particles, so they're shown in different colors. Well, you see that something is happening here. You can see that they're not entirely random. There are some patterns here. And the pattern that you can see is that, you know, all these curves are somewhat different, but if you look more closely, you can realize that they all really look like sine curves. Now they're shifted, and the amplitude can be different, but they're always sine curves. And there's a general conjecture of these four researchers that you always, trajectory of every particle should be a sine curve after proper shift. Okay, that's one question. Now there is another question. Now instead of looking at the trajectory of the wire, you might try to look at the permutation that you get. Well, anyway, you know, by the definition of the sorting network, the sorting network is a sequence of permutations because it was a path and Cayley graph. So you start with identical permutation here, you end by reverse permutation here, and let's, let's look what's happening somewhere in between. So for example, you might try to take a look what's happening halfway through. So altogether you do n times n minus one over two steps, so maybe after n times n minus one over four steps. How, how does your permutation look like? What is it? Well, we need some, again we want to draw some pictures, so uh, how do we draw a permutation? Well, I know one way permutation you can identify with this graph. So for example here, you have you know, permutation two, four, one, three, that's because it is second particles, fourth, first, and third one. And you can identify this permutation with a set of points 1, 2, 2, 4, 3, 1, 4, 3, just because, you know, your permutation is 2, 4, 1, 3. So just, this is just a graph of function which your permutation represents. And again, you can ask a question of how does this graph look like? So what is the picture for the typical large, you know, sorting network? And here's another simulation, again, by Ander Holroyd. So this is a you know, large permutation, you can see that this is something very spe special which is happening here. So you can see that this, all the points which are there, they're clearly inside the circle. And that is one of their conjectures, again, that it should be inside the circle. Moreover, there is some density of particles and then they have precise conjecture how the density should look like everywhere on this picture. So you can ignore the colors here, they don't mean anything, just to make a picture more funny. <laughs> <coughs> Okay, so these two conjectures are still open. So there is some more general conjecture related to geometry of some object called permutahedron, which would imply these conjectures, but that conjecture is also open. There was some recent progress about related but a bit different model of so-called lazy sorting networks where something of this sort was obtained by the two groups of authors. But in this original setup, you know, nobody knows how you can you know, prove something of this sort. Okay, so these are two points of view of the sorting networks, which are lead to open problems. Now I will switch to the third point of view, where we have some progress and where actually we can prove something. So instead of looking at wires on permutations, let's instead of look at swaps. So really these you know, swaps where you swap two adjacent labels in your permutations. So the swaps are just crosses here. So let's forget about everything, but just look at these swaps and just look at them as just unit masses. So you have some point process of your swaps, you know, some random point process, and you want to understand, okay, how do these swaps look like? So maybe an analogy with random matrices would be that, you know, in random matrix things, you have eigenvalues, and you just put particles and positions of these eigenvalues, and you want to look how this point process look like. Now, instead of eigenvalues, we have these swaps, but it is still a point process, and you see two-dimensional point process. And we want to understand something about it. Well, the first result about this 
point process of swap already is in, in the original article on the sorting networks of Angel, Horowitz, Romic, and Virag. So they proved two results. Well, first of all, they proved that the point process of swaps is translation invariant in horizontal direction. So if you just shift all the picture to the right by one, then probabilistically, you know, the distribution is all the same. No, no, nothing changed. And then there's just some property of sorting network. There is some, uh, some nice bi um, bijective map on the sorting network which maps you, sh which shifts you to the right. That's one thing, stationarity. Another thing that is the global law of large numbers which they proved. Namely, imagine you know, how many particles are there. There is n times n minus one over two because you know, each particle increases the number of inversions by one. So let's put on each particle position a mass two over n times n minus one over two, two divided by n times n minus one. So you get some probability measure, which is a random probability measure. Uh, but what they proved is that as n becomes large, and look at this random probability measure, it approaches a non-random probability measure. And what is this non-random probability measure? How does it look like? So that's the formula, that's the density of this limiting thing. So in a horizontal dire direction, of course, in the translation variant, we can get only the back measure. So anything, everything becomes uniform. Now in the vertical direction, that's where really the interesting things are happening. And namely, if you look at the density of the particles in the, lim in the limit, then after you rescale by n, this density starts to look like a semicircle. So that's the formula for the limiting density, the square root of y times 1 minus y, where y is a vertical coordinate and it changes from 0 to 1. So that's the global law of large numbers. Well, you can say, okay, it looks very similar to the random matrix thing, which is called semis uh, Wigner semicircle law. Well, conceptually, actually, I don't know why is it the same object here. So I treat it more like a coincidence because the source of appearance of this semicircle law in this model is very different from, what, from how they appear in the random matrices. So that, you know, I would treat as a coincidence, but in the next result, actually, the random matrices will appear more conceptually, not just as a coincidence. So now, you know, now we, we switch finally to our results, to something you know, more recent, not 10 years ago, but just from this year. And for these results, what we look at, instead of looking globally on this point of point process of swaps, we want to look locally. Really, how this picture looks locally when the size is huge, when you zoom in somewhere in the middle and you want to understand you know, what's happening with these swaps. So what are the distributions of these swaps? Again, the, here is the first theorem that we prove here, and it is joined with the both look at MIT Mustazi Rahman. <clears throat> so we will first speak about only the swaps which are closest to this left boundary of this picture. So since everything is translation variant, it's not very important, but it's easier to start with this thing. So fix some level, like maybe here, the swap between two and three, that's the thing that we want to understand. And let's just look at the time when the first swap happens in this line. Well. How should this time scale? Let's think a little bit. So the total number of swaps is of order n squared, and the number of positions is of order n. So in each position, there'll be like order n scales. OK, and after you realize that, it's not surprising at all that after you, you know, rescale the first time of the swap by n, and then send n to infinity, then you will get some random variable, which we'll call f gap. <clears throat> OK, so what is this random variable? Well, the first thing that you can notice that in this limit transition, you can look at different positions. So maybe you look closer to the border somewhere here, or maybe you go closer to the middle of the picture. Now, the random variable that you get is always the same. So the only thing which will change is rescaling. And the rescaling is exactly according to the same semicircle density that we had before. So that's a rescaling. Moreover, we have explicit formula for the probability distribution here. So here is, the, here is the formula. So its law is given by a certain Fredholm determinant. Well, given, you know, with kernel and this Fredholm determinant given by the sum of the two terms, which look familiar to people from random matrix theory usually because that's you know, that was called sine kernel, that is sine of u minus v divided by u minus v, and then some twist of this sine kernel as a second term. <clears throat> Before proceeding any further, let me you know, mention that there was an, an independent and parallel work by a group of four researchers, Angel, Dovern, Holroyd, and Virag, who were also looking at this problem. And they also proved the existence of the limit here. However, you know, while our methods 
With Mustazi, uh, more methods of integrable probability, so we work with some explicit formulas and pass to the limit on these explicit formulas. Their methods are more probabilistic, and because of that, you know, they also can prove existence, but the identification of the object is more complicated for them because they have some kind of probabilistic description, and it's hard to match with explicit formulas for this just probabilistic description. Well, nevertheless, with our explicit formulas, well, it might look at like some complicated things, some, you know, Fred Holm determinants, so I'm wondering, you know, what is it? Where did it appear before? And there are two ways where the same object, the same distribution appeared before, and both of them are in random matrix area. So the first way where these, you know, distribution F appeared, that's when you look at the object, which is called anti-symmetric GUE, for historic reasons, which is the following object. So you take a matrix X, which will be 2n times 2n matrix of IID real mean zero Gaussian random variables. Well, this matrix has complicated eigenvalues, so you want to simplify it a little bit. For that, you make a skew symmetric matrix out of it. How do you do skew symmetric matrix? You compute x minus x transpose, and that's a skew symmetric matrix. Okay, now if you have real skew symmetric matrix, then its eigenvalues will come in pairs, x and minus x, and all of them will be pure imaginary. This is just some linear algebra. <coughs> Well, in particular, there will be a pair of these pure imaginary eigenvalues which is closest to zero. Turns out that if you look at the distribution of this random pair of random variables, uh, of, of, of these you know, random eigenvalues, well, choose one of them, and then you send the size of the matrix to infinity, then after proper rescaling, you will, bet you will get precisely the same distribution here. So our distribution is this limit of the smallest eigenvalues in this anti-symmetric GUE. So that's the first appearance. Now, the second appearance is actually when you look not in the anti-symmetric matrices, but on symmetric matrices. So start with the same x, but now instead of making it skew symmetric, make it symmetric, but looking at eigenvalues x plus x transpose. Now, it turns out that the distribution function of this eigenvalue, uh, of, of this uh, random variable that we have here, probability that is larger than s, is precisely the limit of the gap probability of this ensemble. So limit of the probability there are no eigenvalues in small interval from minus s to s for this ensemble. Well, actually, that's an interesting, you know, independent question. Why these two descriptions are the same? And I would really appreciate if somebody can, you know, explain it to me because, you know, I know this on the level of formulas. People, you know, computed one thing, people computed another thing, and on the level of formulas, you can see that they are the same. On the other hand, you know, you want to you know, see that this should be something simple because this is just, you know, smallest eigenvalue of one matrix and another matrix, so there should be a nice description. Unfortunately, I don't know any, you know, simple description. Are the formulas the same as finite M or just asymptotic? No, that, these are asymptotic formulas which coincide, yeah. But, I don't know, maybe there is some, you know, nice relation on the finite N as well. <coughs> now, these two, you know, formulas, there is a nice corollary actually of that, nice reformulation of our result. So let me give you this reformulation. Well, recall that everything was translation invariant. So because of that, when you look at something near the origin, like on the left of the picture, really you can do the same results everywhere in between. Because of that, our probability, our distribution of the first swap can be just by some you know, massaging, you can get out of it just a spacing between two swaps. So you have your random sorting networks, you look at some line like here, and you look at the spacing between two adjacent swaps somewhere. Okay, and then as a corollary of what we had, we will have the statement that asymptotically as n goes to infinity, the spacing between two swaps of random sorting networks has the same distribution as bulk spacing of the eigenvalues in a Gaussian orthogonal ensemble. Or there is an universal object called Gordian matter distribution or sometimes exact Wiener surmise, which governs, you know, spacing between eigenvalues in any large real symmetric matrices. Yes, ex exactly. That's why that's not the same distribution. So, 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 so uh, the spacing, that's a bit different distribution than this distribution F gap. So there is a, but there is a simple formula how you transition from one to another. Something like you take derivative of the density, and that's something very simple. So it's not F. Yeah, it's, it's not F gap, yeah. Uh, so, but this is, you know, b because F gap was identified with some, uh, you know, gap probability for GUE, and then this gap probability, you turn it into spacing distribution again by the same procedure. And since the procedure is the same, you conclude that the spacing in GOE is the same as the spacing in, 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 in these random sorting networks. 
Now, this, the spacings between eigenvalues of, art, of uh, symmetric matrices, that's an object which you know, many people studied, maybe starting from the work of Wigner in the, in the middle of the 20th century. And what Wigner was saying is that these spacings are actually a nice model for the energy level spacings in heavy nuclei. And that was his, you know, that's Wigner's surmise, that was his guess, you know, what this distribution, what this spacing should be. So now, with our results, well, we can say that well, Wigner could have said different thing. You know, he could say that, okay, the nice model for the spacing between the uh, energy levels, these are just spacings on certain networks. And the result is, you know, the same. That's the same object. <coughs> okay. So just to compare, there's another result of Alex Rosanov, who was a graduate student at NYU at that moment, that is, I think, in his thesis, that if instead of looking in the middle of this picture, you look near the border of this picture, so you look maybe at the bottommost swaps here, and the scaling will be a little bit different, but still you can compute the limit, and the limiting object will be simpler than what we had. You don't need any fret home determinants. You will have just you know, the first swap, you will have just absolute value of Gaussian random variable, and as a spacing near the bottom of your picture, you will get something this is also called Wigner surmise, but if previous one is called exact Wigner surmise, this is called just Wigner surmise, and which is just, you know, the following distribution: you take two times two uh, matrices of from Gaussian orthogonal ensemble, so real symmetric Gaussian matrix, and compute the difference between two eigenvalues of this matrix. That's what you get here. So in the middle of picture, you have kind of, you know, spacing of infinitely large matrices, but in the very bottom, you have just spacings between two eigenvalues of two times two matrices. <coughs> Okay, now let's go further. So, so far I was describing just a limit of one swap. So it was just really, you know, maybe, maybe two adjacent swaps, their spacings, or maybe leftmost small swap. Well, you can naturally ask what's happening when you go further. So what's happening if now you look at the, you know, joint limit of multiple swaps? So you can just understand how locally this picture looks like. Well, there are, again, different twists how exactly you can ask that question. So the first question, the first way how you can address it is just by looking at the local patterns that you observe in this picture. So you maybe draw a window like here and you look at all the swaps which appear inside this window, then you ignore all the empty spaces and whatever remains is some local pattern which looks like some part of a sorting network. Now you can ask me what kind of patterns appear there and we had a theorem again eight years ago with Omer Angel and Andrew Holroyd, which says that, well, if combinatorially any pattern is possible, then it will actually show up in your configuration quadratically a number of times. So if something is possible combinatorially, that it will be happening you know, with high probability. <clears throat> so that is kind of, you know, this doesn't give you some quantitative control, uh, but it gives you some you know, general feeling that you know, everything is happening. <clears throat> Now, that was actually the first time when I got to know about sorting networks. That was when I was an intern at Microsoft Research. Actually, it was, you know, it started nine years ago. But since that time, you know, we have many developments. And now, again, in our work with Mustafa Rahman, instead of just, you know, saying that all the swaps, all the patterns appear, we can now do precise computations. We can now compute the probabilities and also compute the local spacings in these patterns which appear in your sorting networks. And now I'm going to present this theorem, which we'll describe how this looks like. <clears throat> okay, so how to think about this, you know, limit of several swaps. So we need to draw a window. So the window that we will be drawing will be finite in vertical direction, and it will be again of order n in horizontal direction. And we will look at, at swaps inside this finite window. That's the object that we will be interested in. <clears throat> Now afterwards, you know, you can position your window anywhere in your picture and you look what's happening inside this window. You will rescale the positions of swaps inside the window by n, just because that's the typical spacing as we understood. And you look at this point process, like what's happening inside this window. Now the statement will be that, you know, with some explicit distribution of the limit, the limit exists. So you fix a window, then you send the size of your certain network to infinity, Choose uniformly random one, and probabilistically you will have some point process which governs the limit. Again, there is an independent work of this group of four researchers who also proved existence, but again, they didn't have nice description, and we have a description which I will present in a second. Okay, so there is some you know, object which governs the limit. 
Well, unfortunately, this object is quite complicated, but you know, sorting network itself is quite complicated. So I will need to describe a combinatorial procedure which generates this object, which appears inside sorting networks. <clears throat> so the procedure is two-step. So on the first step, you start with an object which is very familiar to random matrix community. There will be some determinantal point process on uh, uh, z-indexed you know, real lines. So we'll have a number of real lines like that. So there'll be one coordinate which is integer valued and another coordinate which is just real valued. <clears throat> and you will have some particles here. We'll have some point process of particles on this thing. And this point process of particles is determinantal, so any correlation kernel can be any correlation function can be computed as a minor sort of matrix, and this matrix, well, is somewhat explicit, is given by integrals as here. Maybe complicated integrals, but still, you know, you can compute them. In particular, when the vertical coordinates are the same, yi is equal to yj in this formula, then this simplifies to this sum of two signs, which we already saw. That's a deter auxiliary determinantal point process that we need. Now, this determinantal process actually appeared before. So Peter Forrester and Eric Nordenstam in 2009 proved that this determ determinantal point process appears when you look at something which is called anti-GUE corners process. Namely, you again take you know, matrix of IID Gaussian random variables. So this time, it will be infinite matrix. And you create out of its Q-symmetric. Now, it's infinite Q-symmetric matrix. And you start cutting corners of this Q-symmetric matrix. That will be against Q-symmetric matrices. And you look at the eigenvalues of these Q-symmetric matrices, several of those. Maybe you, know, you take a corner of size 1,000, 1,001, 1,002. And you look at the, all the eigenvalues of these corners. And you put them you know, in the same picture. And that's precisely what you get. You know, the scaling limit of these eigenvalues near 0, there's this point process. So you can say that maybe, you know, you say that this le uh, level zero, that is kind of the matrix of size 1,000, and this minus one, that's 1,000 minus one, and this is 1,000 plus one, and you, look, you put the eigenvalues here on these lines, and then you look at the limit when this 1,000 becomes very large. And that's where you encounter the same object. So, you know, in the world, it is called hard edge limit of this anti-GUE process near zero. <clears throat> okay, so that's this determinantal point process. This is maybe an easy object for the random matrix community. However, we need additional steps. So we need to feed this determinantal point process into certain you know, combinatorial procedure, which is a version of what is called Jodataka in uh, combinatorics. So what is this combinatorial procedure? Well, we start with this point process. So these are these you know, hard edge of eigenvalues of anti-GUE. Now we start doing something with that. So this will be you know, blue particles, that's our input, and our output will be brown crosses. These are the crosses which govern the limit of sorting networks. So what do you do? Well, first, <coughs> well, you fix some large window just to avoid you know, speaking about infinities. Now what you do, you locate the particle in your window which is closest to the left border. Well, inside this window, you can see that clearly this one is closest to the left border. OK, you put a brown cross here. So that will be one of the outputs of our procedure. OK, after you have chosen this brown cross, you do a procedure which is called sliding. So what is this sliding? Well, you compute something called sliding path. So how do you do it? You start from this cross, and you start moving to the right. And you look at the two adjacent lines. And you want to find a particle in one of these two adjacent lines. So you move to the right, look around, look around. Oh, here is the first particle. So you found this particle. OK, you move to the line where this particle sits. And then you continue moving to the right. And again, you, go, you, you look at the two adjacent lines. And you again look for a particle there. You move, move, move. Oh, here is another particle. Now you move to this line. Well, again, you continue moving to the right, you found next particle, move to the right, found next particle, et cetera. So that's a sliding path. So is it clear what is the sliding path? OK, now if you after you construct a sliding path, you do sliding. So the sliding is the following procedure. You look at the particles along the path, and well, you can, each particle you can move either plus one or minus one so that it still remains on the path. 
So if you want, you are moving your particles toward the origin, origin, kind of to the left, but modulate that the path is really not going also up and down. So this particle will be moved down, this one will be moved up, this one moved down, this one moved down, this one moved out. So that's a sliding procedure. Okay, so let's make this sliding procedure. Here it is. And at this point, you just remove the particle which became a cross, the, fir the first one that you started from, so you remove it, it's a cross. And then you just repeat your procedure. So you will again locate the leftmost particle, this one. You will construct a sliding path. You will slide particles along this path. You will remove the particle. You will again find the leftmost particle, compute sliding paths, slide the particles, well done. You know, after a large time, all the particles will disappear and all the, these brown crosses will remain. Now, you can notice that here, you know, brown crosses had even coordinates of our picture, and that will be always true. Due to just combinatorics of this picture, they always have even coordinates, so you need to divide these coordinates by two, because we wanted to have integer value things in the end. So you divide these crosses by two, and that's precisely the limit of the sorting networks that we are seeking for. So here's the theorem. So you know, our you know, local limit of this sorting network inside a window is the result of applying this stochastic algorithm, Joda Taka, uh, to determinantal point process, which appears at the hard edge of eigenvalues of this anti-symmetric GUE corners process. Now, <coughs> in particular, if you look carefully at what was happening in our uh, algorithm, you can notice that if some particle was leftmost in some line, like this one was leftmost in this line, and this one was leftmost in this, in this line, then in the end you will have a cross precisely on that position. And because leftmost particle, there is no way how the sliding path can go through leftmost particle. Well, because of that, in our limit of certain, of certain networks, if you look at like uh, positions of the leftmost crosses, like maybe joint distribution of this spacing, this spacing, and this spacing, again, this can be written in terms of the fret home determinants, in terms of this determinantal point process. Well, more complicated probability distribution, that's, then you really need to understand this, this algorithmic procedure to understand them. <clears throat> okay, now let me say a couple of words about the proofs. And in order to speak about the proofs, it's nice to have some analogy with some previous results in this, you know, this subject. Now, there are other famous results how the objects from the studying random permutations will link to something from random magic theory. Maybe the most famous one, that's the Big Dave Johansson theorem from 99. What, what, what was this theorem about? So instead of looking sorting networks, which is complicated object constructed out of permutations, they looked at longest increasing subsequences of permutations. So what is that? Well, you look at the permutation like here. So here's a permutation of, N, uh, of nine letters. And you look at these letters which form an increasing subsequence. So for example, this, three, four, eight, nine, that's an increasing subsequence here. Well, there are maybe many increasing subsequences in your permutation, but you can choose one of them which has the longest length, and you can look at the length of this you know, longest increasing subsequence. Now you sample your permutation